I gave this sermon a title, and it's simply titled, The Sanctuary. It's been a long time since we've been together, and I think it's important for us to be reoriented back to who we are, why we exist. I think it's super important for any organization to understand their identity, to understand specifically why they exist, who they are. Um, And so I want to focus our attention this morning on Luke chapter 15. I'm just going to read two verses. These have become two of my favorite verses in the Bible. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 2. This is the chapter, Luke chapter 15 is the chapter where Jesus tells three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. Um, So lostness is very much the primary theme of this chapter. And not just lostness, not just our lostness, but ultimately the lengths to which God goes to find us in our lostness. But it's these two verses, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15, that put in its proper context what Jesus is about to say. And I don't want to look at any of the parables. I just want to look at those first two verses because as I was thinking about what to say this morning, and specifically what I wanted to preach on this special occasion, uh, these two verses just popped for me. I'm like, if these two verses do not describe who we are as a church and what we are seeking to do as a community, um, I don't know what is. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Now the tax collectors, I love this, I have a screen. Now my eyes don't have to be strained, I can look right at the screen. Now the tax collectors and sinners, we're so technologically advanced now, it's unbelievable, I'm very impressed with us. Um, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. I'll read it one more time. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Let me pray for us. God with One voice we pray, come thou fount of every blessing. And tune our hearts and our minds to see and to savor your amazing grace. God, nobody is here by accident. Every single one of us is here by divine appointment. And that means that you have something very specific to say to each and every one of us. So I pray that you would say it. Say it loudly. Say it clearly. Say it compellingly. I pray that you would overpower our unbelief. That you would answer our doubts. That you would draw near to us. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know our sins, you know our secrets, you know our struggles, you know our fears, you know our insecurities. You know those things about us that we don't even know. You also know those things about us that we don't want anybody else to know. And yet you promised that you would never leave us, you would never forsake us, that there is nothing we can do or fail to do that will ever tempt you to leave us, to abandon us. And so for that reason alone, We give you thanks this morning. Thank you for being a God of amazing grace, a God of unconditional love, and a God of outrageous mercy. I pray now that you would would be our teacher, that you would inform our minds, enlarge our hearts, that you would bend our wills, and that we would hear your voice. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, there has been an outbreak, a pandemic, if you will, of religion inside the church. And it has been killing people for generations, literally. I was reading a book by 
a dear friend of mine who has known me my entire life, Steve Brown. He wrote a book called A Scandalous Freedom, and I was going back through it the last couple of weeks. And the other day, I don't know if it was Tuesday or Wednesday, but one of those days, I read this. He says this, what in the world has happened? How have we taken a message that is so good, so exciting, and so freeing, and made it into a religion of rules and regulations? Where did we go wrong? How is it that being forgiven has made us feel so guilty? How is it that being loved has made us feel so uptight? How is it that being free has made us so bound? How did sinners who have been forgiven repeatedly become judges? How did we get so religious? Steve is 80 now, and he's been around for a long, long time. He's also a dear friend of John Frost, um, and he's seen a lot. He knows what he's talking about. He is, he's an expert in sin, as he likes to say about himself. And he says, I'm so old now, and I've, I've, I'm, oh, I've been around long enough, and I've sinned big enough, where I really don't care what you think. Um, and so he just sort of lays it out there. I think he's exactly right. Religion is all about us. It's all about what we do. It's about me. It's about my performance. It's about my obedience, my faithfulness, my potential, my strength, my improvement, my commitment, my discipline, and so on and so forth. In fact, it's what makes up most of the content of sermons and books and blogs and posts and things like that that are put out there by Christians today. It's primarily about me and what I need to do to thinking about all that God has done for me, what should I now do for him? That's kind of the general flavor of what we get in the Christian community. It's very, very religious. Religion's main message is our need to do more, try harder, get better, climb higher. Religion's all about earning and deserving and scorekeeping and measuring progress. Not just measuring my own progress, but me measuring your progress also. Religion has no room for failure and weakness. It may give lip service to Jesus hanging on a cross, but its emphasis is you and me climbing a ladder. Christianity, in that sense, is emphatically not a religion at all. Christianity, in fact, contradicts religion. Christianity is not a message about you and what you need to do for God. It's a message about God and what he's done for you. The Christian faith, you could put it this way, is not fundamentally about keeping a moral code. It is fundamentally about a God who saves people that fail to keep the moral code. Okay, I'll say that again because I think we get this backwards. Christianity is not, or the Christian faith, is not fundamentally about keeping a moral code. It is fundamentally about a God who saves people that perpetually fail to keep the moral code. Christianity, in other words, is all about grace, and grace defies religious logic. Defies it. Flies in the face of religious logic. It has nothing to do with earning or merit or deservedness. It's it is, in fact, grace is opposed to what is owed. Grace is love coming to you that has nothing to do with you. Grace has nothing to do with weights and measures. It doesn't use sticks and carrots or time cards. It doesn't keep score. Grace is a liberating contradiction between what we deserve and what we get. Well, two things, obvious things, pop out in these two verses. Okay. The contrast between Jesus and religion is so clear here in these first two verses. Uh, the first thing to notice, verse 1, are the kinds of people who were attracted to Jesus. Notice, the social and moral outcasts, spiritual outsiders, people with bad religious resumes, rule, rule breakers, Okay, these were the people who were attracted to him. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. These people were attracted to him. 
They were drawing close to him. Um, And I've said this for years and years now. That if we are not attracting the same kinds of people that Jesus attracted, we are not preaching the same message that Jesus preached. And what I've noticed over the last 20 years or so of being inside the church is that oftentimes uh, churches are filled with the kinds of people who ran away from Jesus and the kinds of people who flocked to Jesus would never darken the doors of most churches. Because most people assume that church is where the good people go. That's where the the good people of society, they go to church. I mean, think about it. Think about just in our community. I mean, look at you. I'm so proud. You know, it's Sunday morning. You guys could be at brunch. You could be on the golf course. You could be on a boat. You could be doing a whole lot of other things. You could still be sleeping, but you're not. You're in church. You know, you're the cream of the crop. Um. It's all those nasty pagans out there who are recovering from their hangovers last night and the people who don't care enough about God to get up and go to church who are sleeping in, who are deciding to forego church and being with God and instead going and doing their own thing. So we've come to believe for whatever reason because it's maybe it hasn't been explicitly stated but at least it's been implied that church is where the good people go. It's where the good people of society gather. I'm going to show you in a minute that it's the exact opposite. Jesus intended it to be the exact opposite of that. Um, We have various ways to gauge the health of a church these days. Leaders talk a lot about financial stability, growth and attendance, soundness of doctrine, and so on and so forth. There are books written about how we can properly gauge the health of a church. But let me tell you this, the real measure of church health is the presence of sinners who know that they're sinners and the absence of self-righteousness. The second thing to notice are the kinds of people who were appalled at Jesus. Verse 2, religious people, spiritual insiders, people with impressive Spiritual resumes, proud rule keepers, proud standard bearers, religious standard bearers. These were the people who were appalled at Jesus. Um, I mean, it says very clearly, and the Pharisees and the scribes, seeing that the bad people were flocking to Jesus, they were appalled, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, the religious leaders grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners. And eats with them. As if they weren't sinners. I love the fact that they're making a distinction there. Number one. This man eats with people like that. We are not like those people. It's like the story I've shared numerous times. Where Jesus is having dinner with some religious leaders. In one of the religious leaders homes. And uh, a prostitute hears that Jesus is in town. She's overcome with guilt and shame and regret. Uh, for the way she lives her life. She hears Jesus in town. She busts through the front door, which if you're the town prostitute, the last party you want to crash probably is the religious leader's dinner party. Nevertheless, she didn't care. She busts through the front door. She falls on her face and she begins cleaning Jesus' feet, washing Jesus' feet with her tears and drying his feet with her hair. And of course, the religious leaders, very much like they do in this verse, verse 2, start grumbling amongst themselves and essentially saying, if this man knew who this woman was, he would never let her touch him. Jesus, knowing that's what they were saying, essentially says back to them, I know what you're thinking and you have it backwards. You think that she needs to become more like you, but I tell you, you actually need to become more like her. We get it backwards. Um, The religious will always grumble about grace because religion works on a hierarchical system in which people or groups are ranked one above the other based on status, some sort of status. Religious people operate with an us versus them mentality. We are better than them. We are more spiritual than them. We are more deserving than them. We are more important than them. We are more right than them. This is why religionists are allergic to grace. Uh, Because grace wrecks hierarchy. It eliminates it. 
Uh, it eviscerates the us versus them mentality and puts us all, regardless of rank or status, on the same level playing field of need. So that there is no us versus them. So may it always be said, and this is my earnest hope, it's Stacy and I's earnest hope and prayer, that it always be said of the sanctuary that the Pharisees and scribes grumble and say, that church receives sinners and eats with them. I, I want, okay, you may not want this, but I want this, and I think God wants this, so I'm on the right side here, okay, if you don't want it. Um, but I want the sanctuary to become known as the outcast church with the outcast pastor filled with outcast people. In other words, a community of people who are sinners and know that they are. And we come week in and week out hungry and thirsty to receive afresh the word of God's forgiveness for sinners. When I was being interviewed about this church a little over a year ago, a year and three or four months ago by the Palm Beach Post, the... the uh, the uh, reporter asked me what I thought was a strange question. He said, in light of you starting this church, um, what are the other churches in town that you see as your primary competitors? And I'm thinking, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, I didn't, I'm not here to compete with any other church, and I don't have any other church in mind. God called us here. We saluted. We came. That's all I know. I don't really know uh, about all of the other churches in town. Um, up this way anyway, I'm a Broward County boy, so I was like, I don't, I don't really know. I said, I will tell you this, however, we, we are seeking to confront um, the religion of just do it with the message of Christianity, which is it is finished. So that, that wherever just do it is found, I want to confront that with it is finished, whether that's inside or outside, any church or the church. And then I went on to say that I think what God is wanting to do here is to establish something that is a little bit more akin in terms of its honesty to AA than most churches we've been exposed to. And he thought that was a little bit funny and asked me to explain a little bit more. And I said, we, we have this idea that there are people in recovery and there are people who are not in recovery. You know, recovery people are people who have an unhealthy relationship with, you know, alcohol or drugs or uh, sex or, you know, food or something to that nature. Um, and so churches ought to have a recovery ministry for people like that inside the church. What they fail to understand is that we are all in recovery. <laughs> if you are a human being... You are in recovery. You may not, like me, I've never had a substance abuse problem, but I'm sure that we all have an unhealthy relationship with something. We are all broken people living in a broken world with other broken people. Uh, religious people hate that stuff because they have to think of themselves as higher, as, as better, as healthier, as more astute. And so when Jesus welcomes uh, ragamuffins, bedraggled, beat up ragamuffins, people who are social and moral outcasts, this rubs religious people the wrong way. Because even us have an us versus them mentality. The Cowboys play the Eagles tonight. I'm not bragging about the Cowboys. They suck this year. And I'm embarrassed to say it, but it's true. And it's painful to watch, okay? Okay. Uh, I have an us versus them mentality. If you are an Eagles fan, it is me against you from now until kingdom come, okay? And that's a silly, stupid example, but we all operate with an us versus them mentality at some level. For many of us, it's conscious, and for many of us, it's, it's unconscious. We all gravitate toward religiosity in one way, shape, or form. And grace wrecks that, interrupts that, um, so when religionists and legalists throw rack rocks at what you're doing, you're doing it right, okay? Um, 
the problem with many Christians today is that we've become religious. We assume that Jesus came to reward the rewardable, that he came to love the lovely, and that he came to give gold stars to the well-behaved. And I can prove it to you. Do you. Have you ever felt at any point in your life, maybe at your worst, that you feel like you've sinned so bad that God won't use you? If you've ever felt like that, even in the smallest way, that exposes the fact that you too have succumbed to the idea that God loves the lovely. He rewards the rewardable. He uses those who are clean. Um, the assumption is that God can only use clean people, people with a clean record. Now, I'm assuming that none of us would say we are clean, but some of us would say we are cleaner than others. I have a good friend named David Zoll who says, We've, we all say that we have fallen short of God's glory, but that doesn't stop us from comparing distances. I mean, yes, I have, I have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, but not as far as that guy or not as far as her. Um, the truth is we are all unclean. And those that acknowledge it are the ones God uses. God does everything through those who know that they are nothing. And he does nothing through those who think that they are everything. I mean, that is just, you cannot, that is in the Bible. There is no one in the Bible that God uses in some massive way that is not a freaking train wreck. Not one. Not one. We take, we sanitize these stories in the Bible and we turn these train wrecked men and women who were intended to be trophies of God's grace into moral heroes to emulate. And we have to edit their life story down to only the good parts. When in reality, the Bible is very intentional to reveal the bad parts also so that it will encourage people like us. So we can go, well, my gosh, if he can use David, he can use me. If he can use Abraham, he can use me. If he can use Adam and Eve, he can use me. If he can use Moses, he can use me. If he can use Peter and Paul, he can use me. If he can use Mary and Martha, he can use me. Deborah, he can use me. God is in the business of loving and using doubters, deniers, adulterers, murderers, and failures of every kind. God only uses dirty people because dirty people are all that there are. You know, the word sanctuary literally means a place of refuge and safety. And one of the reasons I love the name of our church is because historically, churches were places where fugitives could seek protection from the law. If you remember Les Miserables and Jean Valjean is running from the law and he makes his way to a convent and the law, the police force knows that he is there but they can't go in. He's safe. Even though he is still a lawbreaker and a fugitive from the law, the law cannot reach into the sanctuary. And as long as he's there, he is safe from the judgment that awaits him out there. Well, every person, it's so funny, and we named this church the sanctuary on purpose because every person who fled to a church for sanctuary knew they were lawbreakers. They knew it. That's the reason they went. They didn't go because they were clean. They went because they knew they were dirty. They knew they were guilty, but they knew that the long, term, the long arm of the law could not reach them inside the church. Well, um, just like that, we, we believe because the Bible says it, that every one of us has broken God's law and are therefore guilty. We don't believe that church is a place where good people gather. We believe that church is a place where guilty people gather to be reminded that because of what Jesus has done for us, we are safe from the judgment we deserve and forever placed in the strong arms of a loving father. That we are clothed, literally clothed in a straitjacket of righteousness. Not ours, his so, 
Christianity is not for good people who try hard. It's for guilty people who finally give up and throw themselves on the forgiving mercy of Jesus. That's who it's for. And you can't get anything else out of these two verses but that. It's not, these aren't my opinions. I mean, it's right there. Clear as day. You hear the story. It's one of my favorite stories about the guy who was feeling sick. He's feeling ill and he uh, went to the doctor to get some tests done. And the doctor said, I'll, I'll call you uh, when the results come back. And about a week later, the doctor called him. And he said, Jim, I have some bad news for you. And I have some really bad news for you. And the guy's like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, bad news and really bad news? And the doctor said, well, what would you like to hear first? And he said, oh, man, give it, you know, give it to me tenderly, doc, but I'll take the bad news first. He said, the bad news is you have 24 hours to live. He's like... That's the bad news. <laughs> well, if that's the bad news. What is the really bad news? He said, the really bad news is that I was supposed to call you yesterday. Okay. <laughs> Do you, uh, I mean, when, when life seems like it's nothing but bad news and really bad news, just kind of the way our world feels today, you know, um, where do you run? Where do you go? I have been in church my whole life. And sadly, church is all too often the scariest place rather than the safest place for fallen people to fall down and for broken people to break down. And we get letters from people all over the world telling us the same thing. People who feel and literally are abandoned by their Christian community because something bad about them was exposed. Uh, when we first moved here, when Stacy and I first moved here a year and a half ago, uh, we were talking with a woman who was telling us she and her first husband were from Miami and she worked at a church, and the church had a Christian school, and so he worked at the school. And, and she said, my marriage was on the rocks for 10 years. My first marriage was on the rocks for 10 years, but we never told anybody in our church about it because we were afraid that we would look, be looked down on if we were really honest about our struggle. So we faked it. She said, we, for 10 years, we faked it. And it ended in divorce. And we wound up being rejected anyway because our marriage failed. Now, I could tell you a hundred more stories just like that. Of people whose lives have come off the rails for whatever reason. And rather than being embraced by the church, they have felt abandoned. Um, we have, Stacy and I have some friends uh, right now who are going through it. He's... It's a pastor and his wife going through it, just lost their church uh, because of something that happened a long time ago. And I mean, just like overnight, gone. Friends gone, life gone, everything gone. It's almost like the church doesn't know what to do with sin. <laughs> the one institution left in all of society that has an answer doesn't know what to do with it when it shows up. Um, so if your marriage is failing, or you're in the middle of an affair, and no one knows about it, or one of your kids goes off the deep end, is church the first place or the last place that you run to for help? If you find out that your husband is addicted to pornography or that your wife is an alcoholic or that your high school daughter is pregnant um, or that your business is failing, you have to declare bankruptcy. Is church the first place or the last place where you feel you can talk honestly about these things? Well, for far too many people that I've talked to, it is the last. The church tends to encourage perfectionism rather than point to the one who was perfect for us. Which is our only job. It's like we got one job to do. We are all beggars simply showing other beggars where we found bread. That's it. 
We got one job to do. It's to point to the one who did it because we couldn't. In my opinion, the only churches that will thrive in any meaningful way going forward, especially in our cultural climate, will not be castles of purity where only the morally fit feel comfortable, but rather basements of grace where all are embraced and forgiven. Places where sin doesn't shock and grace still amazes. Those will be the places. We want not just this church, but it's my hope and prayer that all churches would be places where sinners and tax collectors feel the freedom to flock, to gather. So you have my word as your friend, as your pastor, um, that to whatever degree we are able we will do our best to ensure that the sanctuary will be a church where it is safe to be real. To let your hair down, to be honest about your struggles, and to tell the truth about yourself without fear of rejection. We will be a church that reminds people of God's promised rest for the weary and burdened, his inexhaustible grace for all of our exhaustion. We will be a church that reminds people that God has forgiven the sins of our yesterdays, todays, and tomorrows, and that the sins we can't forget, God chooses not to remember. It's not that he can't remember. It's even better than that. He can and chooses not to. That's what Hebrews 8.12 says. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Um, I may have shared this a few weeks ago on the live stream, but uh, one of my friends said this. Well, Corey Tenboon was a, a saintly woman of a previous generation who said that when God takes our sin and he dumps it in the deepest part of the ocean and puts up a no fishing allowed sign. And one of my friends commenting on that said, yeah, but Christians are addicted to scuba diving. <laughs> So true, you know. Um, we will be a church that reminds people that there is nothing we can do or fail to do that will ever tempt God to leave us or forsake us. A church that reminds people of God's unconditional love. We will, in other words, strive to be a sanctuary. A judgment-free zone of safety and refuge where people can come as they are, not as they should be, and find love and joy and laughter and rest and hope and healing and acceptance and forgiveness and mercy and help and all the rest. Uh, you notice the doors were red when you walked through. If you didn't, they're red. You can look at them when you walk out the door. Um, we did that on purpose. I have a friend who is a recently retired pastor in... Nashville, Tennessee, by the name of Ray Ortland, and he described the historical rootedness of church doors being painted red. Because every time we walk in and out of this room, we do so recognizing that we come into God's safe presence through the blood of Jesus. It is what God has done for us that provides the safety and the rest that we so desperately need. We will strive to be a church where sinners and tax collectors draw near to. I know that's what I need, and I know that's what you need too. We all need a safe place to land and a soft place to fall. All of us do. I've said, you know, you all know my story. Most of you do anyway. Um, but five years ago, a little over five years ago, five and a half years ago now, five and a half years ago, I mean, my life just came off the rails. And I've learned two primary things in the last five years. Number one, um, that... Your greatest failure may be in front of you. 
It's a sobering thought. It's a scary thought. Something we don't want to think about. Uh, But my life and the life of many other people we read about in the Bible and throughout history prove that this is true, that it's very possible that your greatest failure may be in front of you. That's truth number one that I've learned. Truth number two, you are capable of falling in a way now that is unthinkable to you. Unthinkable. Your life, it's possible for your life to go off the rails in a way that is right now amazingly unrealistic to you and unthinkable. But the good news is that grace always runs downhill. And when we find ourselves at the bottom, God is always there waiting for us. Waiting for us. Always. Grace, like water, always runs downhill. Always runs to the lowest place. And that in light of the fact that we may fail massively, that our life may come off the rails, we may experience a disappointment and a level of discouragement that we never even knew possible. It could involve us, it could involve our kids, it could involve our spouse, it could involve our business, it could involve our finances, whatever the case may be. This is a scary place to live. I mean, I've said numerous times over the last few months, if this world is all that there is, why would any of us have any hope to get out of bed in the morning? Um, So it's possible because this is a scary place and it's filled with scary people. (laughs) It's possible for life to go off the rails. Someone's life, someone that you know, their life, your life. And while others may leave us and forsake us, God promises that he never will. And we want to be a church that reminds people of that stubbornly, relentlessly, myopically. Because we forget so often. And we think this whole thing is about us and what we do for God rather than about him and what he's done for us. Let me pray for us.